The SCP universe is filled to the brim with world-ending events, reality-disrupting objects, and cosmic horrors unknown to the majority of mankind. Dragons that seek to destroy humanity, doomsday cults, worlds within worlds within worlds full of adventures, history, and lore. But that's only one aspect of SCP stories. Grant that it's the most popular one, it's the one that most people think of when they hear SCP. But if you've seen my other SCP video, linked up in the corner by the way, then you know that personally I'm a fan of the more, let's call them, subtle entries. It's almost been exactly one year since I made that video and I called it a summer special, a bit easier for me to produce and probably a bit more casual for you to consume. And here we are, because I'm thinking, let's turn it into a tradition. These are my Patreon producers, by the way, and at the end of the video, the rest of my Patreon supporters will be shown. If you want to join them, there's a link down in the description. Now, in the last video that I've mentioned a few times now, we talked about six SCPs that made me cry. And I thought that this time we'd, you know, stay away from the sadness a little bit and keep it as casual and subtle uh, as possible. Therefore, we're going to be talking about four SCPs that are just a guy. Just... Normal men. We're just normal men. Just innocent men. We're just innocent men. And with all of that said, uh, have something to drink, sit down comfortably. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, and let's begin. This document was recovered from Sight's precious document vault. Anomalous object number AO1504 WGGYXJK. Item description. An unremarkable man who is not able to be harmed. Date of recovery. The of 19 Location of recovery. Current status. AO1504 is held in a standard humanoid containment cell. And then that's been replaced uh, with missing. Addendum 1504-1. Interviewed. AO1504. Interviewer. Dr. Lloyd. Forward. AO-1504 is being questioned on its background. Begin log. <clears throat> so, what's your name? I don't remember. Joe something. Okay. Now, what year were you born? 1982. Thank you for the year, but do you have an exact date? No, I uh, never knew when I was born. Oh, ex Excuse me, my, my nose is bleeding. <clears throat> Sorry about that. That was weird. Never been prone to random nosebleeds. It's fine. Maybe a storm is coming. I've heard the changing air pressure can make a person's nose bleed. Maybe. Do you know why you can't be hurt? The subject was silent for a few seconds, then proceeded to weep. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want to talk about it. That's fine. Thank you for your cooperation with today's interview. You may return to your room. And log. Addendum 1504-2. We didn't know his true anomaly. He didn't know what he could really do. Well, I guess he affects computers too. Our automatic security system began to have hiccups. A breach here, a breach there. But nothing that surprised us. But then, our kidder got out. Only about half of the staff here realized it. The other half? All died. We managed to contain it. We sent a request for more staff, but they never responded. Our supplies were dwindling, so we asked for more. Nothing. They didn't even acknowledge our existence. We had more breaches, more deaths, yet we never questioned these breaches or these deaths. I don't know why we didn't question those deaths. Earlier today, we had a site-wide containment breach. All the doors opened because of those hiccups I mentioned earlier. Most of the remaining staff members are dead. Those who are still alive are few and far between. We can't contain a breach of this magnitude, and the other Foundation sites will probably ignore it. They'll cite it as completely normal and ignore it. I'm going to put this in the vault, and then I'm going to set off the on-site nuke. 
I'm already badly hurt and the blast would save more lives than it will end. If anyone ever finds this, tell my wife that I love her and that I'm sorry for spending so much time in my job. Tell her that I said goodbye and that I'm thinking of her as I die. Researcher Daryl Lloyd. Note. This was handwritten on the document, presumably before it was put in the precious document vault. There are bloodstains on the document. Later analysis proved this to be Dr. Lloyd's blood. Parts of this document are unreadable due to smearing. Addendum 1504-3. The site nuclear warhead was detonated on the 4th of 19 to counteract a class 7 containment breach. A total of anomalies were destroyed in the blast, anomalies were recovered, and anomalies are missing, including AO-1504. Foundation personnel died in Site This document has been updated per the new information recovered from Site Item number SCP-1504 Object class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-1504 is not currently contained. If any Foundation personnel see the subject, they are to contact the current project head. In the event SCP-1504 is found, it is to be brought to Area 114 and contained in a 3 by 3 by 3 meter containment chamber. To enter the subject's containment chamber, a total of four Level 3 staff members are needed. Two staff members must remain inside the control room to remotely enact the failsafe should a containment breach occur. The failsafe consists of flooding the containment chamber and surrounding areas with halothane vapor, which has proven to be the only viable method to incapacitate SCP-1504. Again, that's been striked out and replaced with Extensive research has shown that SCP-1504 can be incapacitated by blunt force trauma to the head. The subject is to be kept fully contained and incapacitated at all times through the use of restraints and halothane vapor. The other staff members must release multiple locks simultaneously. A minimum of four guards are to be protecting them at this time. After all locks are released, one staff member may enter the containment chamber. The guards must be ready for a containment breach at all times the containment chamber is open. No automatic systems may be used in Area 114. All doors and containers must be locked using simple combination locks or simple padlocks. All personnel working in Area 114 must have a high aptitude for parapsychology or a strong resilience to perception shifts. Description. SCP-1504 is a Caucasian male, standing at 1.95 meters tall. The subject's appearance is unremarkable, aside from a small birthmark on its right shoulder. SCP-1504's anomalous traits include its inability to be harmed or killed. All actions carried out by SCP-1504 will be perceived by surrounding individuals as being within expectations for the situation. SCP-1504 has been known to attack personnel who will then believe circumstance or their own doing has hurt them. The subject is able to affect electronic and automatic systems. SCP-1504 was brought to the attention of the Foundation because of its inability to be harmed and was classified as an anomalous object after initial testing. The subject was held at site in the anomalous object wing of the facility. On the 14th of 19, a site-wide security failure and subsequent containment breach resulted in the on-site nuclear warhead being detonated. SCP-1504 was declared missing after a search of the site did not reveal the confirmed death. A low-priority search was issued, but was soon raised to high priority after the above document was found. Addendum 1504-1 After being further analyzed and sent through multiple filters, it was discovered that SCP-1504's responses were different from what was previously recorded. The document has been updated to include these responses. Interviewed SCP-1504 Interviewer Dr. Lloyd Forward SCP-1504 is being questioned on its background. <clears throat> so, what's your name? I'm not gonna tell you. You'll just ignore me. Okay. Now, what year were you born? I told you. You wouldn't even notice if I punched you in the nose. Thank you for the year, but do you have an exact date? I, I didn't give you a fucking year. Hey! Hey, Doc, watch this! Oh, ex excuse me, my, my nose is bleeding. <clears throat> Sorry about that. That was weird. 
never been prone to random nosebleeds. It's because I fucking punched you. Maybe. Do you know why you can't be hurt? I could say anything. I could do anything. I could say that I'm gonna rape and kill your wife and you wouldn't even notice. Hell, I could actually rape and kill your wife and you wouldn't notice. I'm living in a virtual hell, because I can't die. I'm gonna take a step outside this room, I'm gonna take the guard's gun, and then I'm gonna shoot myself with that gun, and nothing, fucking nothing, is gonna happen. The subject appears to be in tears at this point. Do you know what it feels like to be in a room crowded with people, and they all ignore you? Do you know how hellish my life is? I want to die. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you for your cooperation with today's interview. You may return to your room. And log. Okay, I know I said we weren't gonna do sad ones this time, and then I started the video off with a guy who literally murdered countless people due to his own inability to die, but how could I not include this one? But I'm sorry, okay? Let's, let's move on, let's move past it. We don't have to think about him anymore. Uh, let's just do the next one. SCP-202 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Research is being conducted on SCP-202 at Bio Research Area 12. Here, researchers are actively seeking to understand and cure the conditions plaguing SCP-202. He is granted full amenities of Level 0 personnel quarters when not being examined. SCP-202 is under the assumption that he is in a hospital and is not to be made aware that his doctors are in fact SCP researchers. Description: 202 is an Asian British male, 41 years of age, who performs all actions in reverse. He does not appear to age in reverse, but speaks, eats, walks and performs all other actions opposite to what is considered normal. 202 speaks in reverse English with a British accent. Recording his speech and playing it backwards at a one-to-one -one speed allows for normal communication. The subject asserts that he was a normal individual living in Stockport, England, until he woke up one morning four years ago and found that every action he attempted to do, he did in reverse. He pledges that no matter how hard he tries, he is unable to carry out normal patterns of motion. He also claims to be unable to explain how he is able to walk backwards through crowded halls without bumping into others or other inexplicable acts. Watching 202 is particularly frustrating to Foundation biologists and physicists. Rather than acting as a pump, the chamber of his heart acts as vacuums, pulling his blood toward the heart in arteries and pushing it away in veins. 202 actually exhales oxygen and processes carbon dioxide. Researchers are fervently seeking answers to how his respiratory system works and if, on the molecular level, the Krebs cycle of metabolism could possibly run in reverse. His eating habits confound researchers as well, as food comes up from his stomach and out of his mouth, and undergoes a reverse chew. For example, when eating a sandwich, 202 somehow regurgitates a bolus of food that reverse chews into a portion of sandwich. Boluses are added from 202 into a complete sandwich that defies laws of both physics and biology. The resulting sandwich is completely normal and edible according to research. 202 claims that he isn't aware of what he's going to eat until it starts coming. As for waste, when 202 needs to go to the... See addendum. 202 does not think in reverse and cannot foresee the future, as some personnel believe. He is rather good at Rubik's Cubes and enjoys dismantling jigsaw puzzles. Addendum. Direct order from Commander... We're not having any more discussions about what happens when 202 goes to the bathroom. I think we can all paint a pretty picture of what goes on in there. The damn scientist can't explain where it comes from and neither can the plumbers, so let's just leave it at that. The poor man has enough problems. Give him the courtesy of a little privacy. Until the quacks can come up for a reason to study it, I want all data on the topic expunged. So one of the reasons that I wanted to include this one specifically is the fact that it's such a low number at 202. At this point that I'm filming this, I think we've got over 7,000 SCPs. And while the writing quality and also the originality has just gotten better over time, there's something to these kinda early ones to me. I really like them. They're kinda goofy, they're a little silly, they're very simple, and it's just a sort of like golden age to me. But I do understand that if you're like a hardcore SCP enjoyer, uh, these early ones are, you know, you're probably pretty sick of them. And unfortunately for you, but fortunately for uh, the rest of us, uh, the next one is also a pretty early entry. SCP-1-1 
SCP-426 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures I am to be sealed in a chamber with no windows through which I may be viewed. The door to my chamber must have a label completely unrelated to my designation or identity in order to prevent unintended spread of my primary effect. Only level 3 and above personnel are to know of my presence and particularly of my properties. Assigned personnel are to be rotated out on a monthly basis to prevent contamination by my secondary effect. Psychiatric evaluation is mandatory at the end of the month. If personnel are deemed unaffected, they may be reassigned to me no less than four months after their last rotation with me. Any affected personnel are to be given a Class C amnestic and transferred to a different site. Description Hello, I am SCP-426. I must be introduced this way in order to prevent ambiguity. I am an ordinary toaster, able to toast bread when supplied with electricity. However, when any human being mentions me, they inadvertently refer to me in the first person. Despite all attempts, there is yet to be a way to speak or write about me in the third person. When in my continuous presence for over two months, individuals begin to identify themselves as a toaster. Unless forcibly restrained, these people will ultimately harm themselves in their attempts to emulate my standard functions. I was discovered in the home of the family after the gruesome deaths of three of its members. I had been given to the younger Mr. and Mrs. as a wedding gift. No card or any other identifying markings had been found on my box. Approximately two months after the family received me, fire crews were dispatched to the home due to an electrical fire. The younger Mrs. died from the electrical discharge that she had caused when attempting to devour an electric socket. The other two victims had died shortly before the fire occurred. The elder Mrs had gorged herself with nearly 10 kilos of bread before her stomach burst and she died of internal bleeding. The younger Mr. died of severe blood loss after attempting with me. The sole survivor was the elder Mr. who was suffering from severe malnutrition. He stated that he had inserted some bread a week prior and was still waiting for the toast to pop out. I was confiscated by the foundation after police noted my unusual properties. A Class C amnestic was administered to the affected officers. Experiment Log-1 Subject D-Class Personnel D4261, henceforth referred to as D1. Procedure D1 was asked to describe what he believed was contained in my chamber. He was not informed about my identity or properties. Details D1 stated, I'm probably some huge monster holed up in there. That's what you guys have all over the place, right? D1 remained oblivious to his use of the first-person pronoun. Experiment 2 Subject D2 Procedure D2 was placed in my chamber and given regular meals through a dispenser. No communication with D2 was permitted. Multiple cameras were situated in the chamber, positioned so that I was outside of their field of vision, but allowing constant observation of D2. We remained sealed until my secondary effect manifested in the subject. I was bolted to the floor so that I could not be moved into a camera's view. Details. After 45 days of isolation, D2 wrapped his arm around me and began conversing with me, stating that we were brothers. D2 never deviated from using the first person plural when speaking with me. Subject was terminated one hour after this event. It is theorized that the isolation accelerated the progression of my secondary effect. Experiment Log-3 Subject D3 Procedure A screw was removed from me and shown to D3, who was asked to describe it. D3 was not informed about my identity or properties. Details D3 referred to it as My screw Consistent with Experiment-1, the subject was oblivious to his use of the first person in his description. This suggests that, even if I were destroyed, my effects would still be inherent in my remains. Experiment Log-4 Subject D4 Procedure D4 was placed in isolation in a cell adjacent to my chamber to be observed until my secondary effect manifests. Details No effect appeared. D4 was terminated 90 days after the start of the experiment. Thank God there are some limits to my effect. A lot of us were really starting to get worried about me. Doctor. 
So now you might be thinking, hey, didn't you say that these were supposed to be normal, innocent men? This was a toaster, that's not a guy. Uh, and to that, I want to say, yes, it is. Have you seen the brave little toaster? Are you trying to tell me that this isn't a little guy? That's a little, that's, that's a little dude right there, if I've ever seen one. Also, it's my video on my channel, so I decide that, that this, this SCP, that's definitely, that's a, that's a little guy. Let's move on. SCP-6451 Containment Class Pending Raisa Notice Following the events of Addendum 6451-2, portions of this file are outdated and awaiting rewrite. Updates Pending Special Containment Procedures SCP-6451 is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber in Foundation Facility Area 179. Description SCP-6451 is a man of unknown descent, name and origin, resembling a healthy adult male. 6451 stands at 1.9 meters, demonstrates above average intelligence, and possesses ordinary biological and physiological functions. 6451's anomalous properties, if any exist, are unknown. Addendum 6451-1 History the Foundation has contained 6451 since 1952. In a mass transferal of anomalies from one of the organization's predecessors, the American Secure Containment Initiative, ASCII. All documents on 6451, should they have existed, were lost in the transfer. It is theorized this was a clerical error, though research efforts are ongoing. As a result, 6451's anomalous properties, history of containment and identity are entirely unknown. Its status as an SCP object is granted under the assumption that ASCII had sufficient reason to contain 6451. Correspondence with ASCII personnel, both those integrated into the Foundation and elsewhere, has not resulted in further knowledge related to 6451. Both punitive and rewarding measures have proven unsuccessful in persuading 6451 to reveal information about itself. All attempts to gain further information from 6451 on itself have ended roughly the same. See most recent interview log. All right, 6451, time for our weekly check-in. How have you been feeling? Just peachy, Doc. Good, good, that's great to hear. We're happy for you. Silence. All right, you know the drill. You want to tell us who you are yet? Nope. Would you be interested in participating in further testing? Absolutely not. Are you aware of anomalies relating to yourself the Foundation is not privy to? I am. And do you remember why you were detained by the ASCII? I do. And would you care to elaborate on either of those answers? No. Addendum 6451-2. Behavioral Reports. 6451 has demonstrated numerous abnormal patterns of behavior over its years of containment none of which have been determined to be anomalous or the result of the object's anomalous properties. Notable events have been listed below. 6451 has not expressed discomfort when exposed to isolating environments, and measures such as removing amenities from its containment cell have not persuaded the entity to reveal information about itself or comply with the Foundation's demands. 6451 will often request items to be delivered to its containment chamber, which are often approved in an attempt to gauge potential anomalous properties through interactions between the entity and ordinary objects. Requests have included a complete library of Arthur Conan Doyle's bibliography, granted, several model train kits and associated materials, granted, a television, granted, a complete medieval suit of armor, granted, 17 kilograms of excess wood shavings from a hickory tree, granted, and a coffin that had been modified for use as a bed, granted. No items have provided insight regarding 6451. 6451 has amused itself by vocalizing screeches and cries for hours on end. When confronted about this, it revealed that these sounds were intended to, quote, protect its carnal purity, unquote. 6451 was allowed use of a personal computer in hopes it would reveal personal information about itself. 6451 has since spent the entirety of its time on the internet becoming proficient in the hobby of birdwatching and researching the lives of the first ladies of the United States. 6451 is under the assumption that television personality Martha Stewart is a first lady of the United States and is unable to be convinced otherwise. 
6451 will fabricate information about other objects in containment, citing random SCP designations coupled with vague statements. Examples include stating that SCP-7000 communicated with it in a dream and that it is currently in a relationship with SCP-6556. These claims are presumed to be false and the Foundation does not suspect 6451 to have knowledge of other anomalies. 6451 will, at times, perform a handstand until it passes out from asphyxiation, prompting medical attention. When asked about why it continues this behavior, 6451 stated that if you could get the medical experience without paying a cent, you'd do it too. SCP-6451 crawls on all fours inside its containment cell. Dr. Trenton enters. Morning, SCP-6451. I hope I didn't interrupt anything important. 6451 snorts loudly and growls. Uh -huh. Well, uh, new policy going around humanoid containment sites. I have to give you these enrichment activities. Puzzle, too. Trenton approaches 6451. It hunches forward and growls again. I'm an anteater. All right. I'll just leave the puzzles over here then. Trenton bends down to place the boxes near 6451. It jumps back and winces in pain. You're stepping on my snout. I'm not even near you. You're stepping on the ants. Yeah, yeah. You've been crawling on your hands and knees for a fucking week now. 6451 hisses. 6451 complained of very small entities inside its containment chamber that were procreating inside the entity's nose, prompting Foundation investigation. 6451 frequently will set traps using objects inside its chamber in hopes of catching these entities. On multiple occasions, 6451 has claimed it is possessed by an entity, marking each occasion with apparent bowel incontinence. This has resulted in multiple interviews ending due to 6451 defecating in front of and on personnel. The existence of these entities is disputed among the Foundation. 6451 has declared multiple dates as its birthday and expresses agitation when attending personnel refuse to acknowledge a date as a cause for celebration. 6451 once spent weeks alluding to an important event, speaking in vague notions regarding an impact or the reckoning. On February 19th, 1989, a delirious 6451 alerted personnel that the event was about to happen and requested it to be transferred to a medical ward. After straining and screaming to itself for five hours, 6451 sneezed and promptly returned to its regular demeanor, stating that it was the event in question. Amenities were removed from 6451's containment chamber for a month. The entity remained unfazed. 6451 has expressed great interest in Michael Bay's Transformers film franchise, as these films contain subliminal and overt religious signaling crafted by the members of GOI-004, The Church of the Broken God, 6451's request to view the films was granted in hopes that a link between the two would surface. 6451 was incredibly engaged by the films, calling them masterpieces, and spending multiple interviews discussing them with personnel at length. A connection to the church has yet to be determined. During early containment, when punitive measures were being explored as a means of extracting information from 6451, the entity was threatened with a position as D-class personnel. 6451, much to the chagrin of attending staff, excitedly accepted this position and proceeded to defy most commands given to it during testing attempts. Two indirect object neutralizations, a large loss of data, and a containment breach resulted before 6451 was pulled from duty. For three weeks, 6451 responded to all questions with the statement, I'm nobody, and refused to elaborate. This prompted a large-scale investigation of all documents related to GOY000, nobody, in hopes of correlating them to 6451. The investigation was inconclusive, and 6451's motivation for repetition of this phrase remains unknown, with 6451 feigning ignorance to ever doing so. 6451 consumes both its finger and toenails. Because 6451 performs within the above average margins on intelligence measuring tests, it is assumed that the majority, if not all, of these actions are performed with the intent of 6451 amusing itself, and not due to a medical or mental condition, as several personnel have suggested. Addendum 6451-2 Status Update On the 29th of August 2020, 6451 died of unknown causes inside its containment chamber marking 68 years of containment. Both autopsy of 6451 and analysis of the chamber did not suggest a probable cause of death. 
Following 6451's death, Area 179's directorial board held a conference regarding the object's continued status as an SCP file, despite it not displaying any known anomalous properties. This conversation lasted for 12 consecutive hours. Proposed solutions included designating it as decommissioned, X, or ARC, all of which were denied for not meeting necessary criteria to do so. The conference concluded that the SCP-6451 file would remain untouched, in hopes that ongoing race reassessment of ASCII documents would reveal SCP-6451's original documentation. Two days later, on the 31st of August 2020, the cadaver of SCP-6451 ejected a small piece of paper from the entity's navel. A transcription of the text, which was written in pencil, has been reproduced below. Congratulations! You found the Guy Man. Collect them all. The Guy Man. You did it. Well done. Honestly, I'm not even gonna expand on why I chose to have that last guy in here. Because, I mean, come on, that's like the quintessential, just the normal man SCP. Other than the, uh, what's his name, uh, the, the reluctant dimension hopper. But if I see a single comment asking why I didn't talk about the reluctant dimension hopper, then I'm gonna turn this car around, okay? But that's it. Those are four SCPs that are uh, just a guy. I want to thank you so much for watching this far. I want to thank my patrons. And I also want to apologize if some of the voice work was a little tacky. Uh, you know, I I'm, not, I'm no master of accents. I haven't even mastered my own accent <laughs> yet. Uh, but, you know, I, I try to work with, with what I got. Um, but thank you so much for watching again. I hope you're having a good summer. Uh, now I'm gonna go celebrate midsummer because that's a thing we do here. Uh, and then I'm gonna come back from that, edit this together and publish it, which is weird because you're like watching this uh, now as I'm saying this, but also I'm recording this, you know, about maybe a week before it's being published. I'm ranting at this point. Thank you so much for watching. I'm really tired, uh, a little bit loopy. Have I missed anything? No? Okay, cool. See ya. I'm not even gonna do a second take. Just gonna go with that one. Okay.